doesn't work. And I think that motivation, it's, it's just really an awkward word. So I'd like to propose a different way to look at motivation. I'd like to, you to think that you're, you're always motivated. You're always 100% motivated. Even when you're not, you know, someone lazing on the couch and says, I'm not lazy, I'm just 100% motivated to do nothing. <laughs> but I think it's a really, really constructive look at motivation. Because if we get motivation out of our heads and into the actual reality, if we think, okay, you're 100% motivated to act in that particular way right then, so what is it that's not working in your goals or your projects that's not getting you motivated to do that work? Why aren't you doing more meaningful work and why are you doing this? You're 100% motivated, so there must be something about the way the work is designed, right? Because that's the secret ingredient. Um, you know, academics, uh, I did my PhD in filling the gap between goal setting and goal getting. Academics call this uh, the constructive discontent between your current state and your desired future state. Um, and there's a secret ingredient to all success, and I'm about to reveal it to you. Dramatic pause. If I wrote a book on this, it would have one page and one word on it, and that is work, right? To actually make ideas happen, to actually achieve your goals, you have to put in the work. Now Edison knew, it, he knew this, he said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So if we want to make ideas happen, if we want to achieve our goals, we have to realise it's not about ideas, it's about making ideas happen. And I'd like to propose that we, when it comes to motivation, we spend less time trying to feel good and more trying to actually do good. Uh, I think that'll be a lot more helpful. Um, here's a picture of me in the early stages of my PhD uh, and some of my audience, uh, early retirees, helping them to achieve their goals. They all had stuff that they wanted to achieve and I was there to, to help them. And I was at the forefront of motivation science. I was researching, like kind of like the academic hero, researching stuff, all new peer-reviewed research and motivation. And then I was out there teaching them all about how to do, you know, set goals. And I had my own goals. I had a massive bloody thesis to write and things like that. So I was living in the motivational literature, teaching it and using it. Except, I was playing a lot of World of Warcraft at the same time. <laughs> um, yeah, which was, which was a bit odd. I, I'd say to people, all right, I'm off to go to work. Um, yep, don't disturb me. And I'd go off to my office, because um, uh, I was lecturing at the university. So I had my own office. I'd close the door and close the blinds, and then I'd log in to Azeroth. And I'd become like a level 40 blood elf rogue. Um, and I was the guild alchemist, so I had actual work to do. I had to make stamina potions, mana potions, health potions <laughs> for my guild. Because if I did not, and I felt bad if I did not log into Azeroth, my, my guild would suffer. They'd go up against dragons and whatnot, and they wouldn't know I had their health potions. And if I did my work, then I'd get access to the epic loot that they brought back in. It was all very good. It was fantastic. And this went on for a good three months. I was spending a lot of time in World of Warcraft, despite having all the goals, despite teaching goal setting. And I, was, I was putting on half a kilo a month, you know, sitting there writing about the importance of motivation and stuff. It was bizarre. Um, then I moved house. After three months, I had to move house, and I lost my internet connection for a while. And that made me think, what was going on there? Why was it that this game was more uh, enticing? Why did it get me more enthusiastic about doing work than what most of the literature was saying? And it got me curious about motivation and the future of work. What might this imply for the future of work? Now, I'm not the only one working in this space. There's great research happening in this area. I'd like to share one of the ones that was published in the Harvard Business Review in 2010. The researchers was asking this question, what is it that gets employees most enthusiastic about doing the work? It's an important question. And they gave, uh, they asked this of uh, over 600 managers and from all different industries and different levels, and they gave them a whole bunch of really good answers to choose from. I would like you to just mumble to the person next to you, make sure you mumble in case you get it wrong, just mumble to the person next to you what you think the number one thing is. Just do that now. So, the thing that the 600 managers ranked as number one was recognition of good work. Recognition of good work. Now, the researchers thought this is interesting and uh, they thought, you know what might be novel? 
let's actually ask the employees themselves, see what they think. And so they asked a whole bunch of employees, followed them over several years, analysed over 12,000 journal entries to find out what is it that gets employees most enthusiastic about doing work. The interesting thing is the thing that they ranked as number one was what the managers ranked as dead last, and that is a sense of progress. Progress is pretty powerful as a motivator. It provides a scaffolding. If a goal is like your, your achievement marker and the motivation is a fuel to get you there, progress is like the train tracks that give you traction to achieve it, to help you bridge that gap between where you are and where you want to be. And it kind of makes sense. Progress, the, 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 the less the latency between your effort and meaningful feedback you receive, the more likely you are to put effort in if, if it's helping you to move closer to your goal. Think about that time that you've had a big assignment to do or a project to do and it's really vague, you don't know where to start. So what do you do? You go onto Facebook or you check your emails or you do your dishes or something, anything that will give you a sense of progress so you can trick yourself into thinking that you're effective. Uh, that is what we do. We default to the type of work that is designed in a way that gives us a sense of progress. So how can we use this for meaningful work? Well, let me talk a little bit about games. Um, this is what gets me really excited. Um, so I know some people do this. I've, I've, heard, I've heard it's quite enjoyable. Apparently it's called sport. Um, <laughs> uh, something about the dynamics, like there's, there's a clear boundary and you step in and different rules operate, and something about the parameters of this kind of behavioural thing uh, compels people to run around chasing a ball, putting their life and limb at risk uh, in order to achieve points which are completely artificial within this context of a game, right? It's, it's fascinating. Um, and some people play chess and that's lovely too. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, they have discretionary time and you know, why not blow three hours in a, an extremely complex game? Um, who, does anyone here play this game? Just put your hand up if you do. Okay, oh cool, yeah, one, one or two, yeah, good on you. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, so this is another game that I don't quite understand, well actually I do, that's kind of my thing. Um, golf, if the goal of golf is simply to get the hole, the, the ball in the hole, one would think you could simply just walk up to the hole and put it <laughs> into the hole. Um, and as a redhead, I don't like to get in the, out in the sun too often, so I had this idea that you could just drill a hole into your desk and then you could just pop balls into the hole <laughs> all day and you'd be winning, right? Um, yeah, except it turns out that there are rules that actually make it difficult. So what's happening is people are choosing to engage in difficult work. They're choosing to engage in challenging work. And when we're not playing games, we love watching games like Iron Chef, Master Chef, and that um, sports thing um, that's on. That seems to be watched a lot. And then, you know, there's other types of games like this. Who here knows what this game is? Yeah? This is a game that millions of people play. Now guess what, if you play this, you are guaranteed to fail. Everyone who's played this game has failed and most people have played it more than once. They keep going back even though they're going to fail. Now you might be surprised about all this, right? Some of you might be thinking, oh, this is for young people, right? Games, video games. Um, and it is true. Some estimates suggest that uh, countries with high gaming cultures, by the time a young person reaches 21 years of age, they'll have spent 10,000 hours playing video games, which is pretty exciting, yeah. But right now, right now, this, you know, each week, over 500 million people spend 7 billion hours playing online video games. Now the average age is typically about 30 to 35, depending on what country you're in, and 40 to 40, 40 to 50, 40 to 47 percent in Australia, it's about 47 percent are actually female. There are more adult female gamers than there are teenage boy gamers. Quite interesting. Who here has been spammed on uh, Facebook by someone who wants, <laughs> who, who wants to, you know, just to lend a hand to milk my virtual cows or something? Um, <laughs> There, there was at one stage, I think in 2010, more people playing Farmville than there were on Twitter. Um, you can walk down into your local corner store instead of getting like a, a gift card for a store or for something to eat. You can buy virtual seeds that go into this game and you'll never be able to eat them. But they might help you to extend that progress bar up the top. Because progress is something we like to do. We like to make progress. Now who here today has played Angry Birds? Just be honest. Oh wow, okay fantastic, well, that is awesome, okay cool, yeah, I'm, I'm, in, I'm amongst friends. Um, yeah, 30 million people play this game every day, and what is it? It's just, it's just a challenge presented to you. It's like, yeah, I'm going to choose to engage in well-designed challenging work. 
Uh, some people choose to pay money to engage in world design challenging work, World of Warcraft. Some of the challenges are so epic that they can only be sold through diverse collaboration with really specialised teams. And then there's games like this, uh, EVE Online. Have a close look at this. Like, have a close look at that. Doesn't that look a lot like that? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> the difference is, we pay money for people to do that, and people pay money to do that. And they choose to do that, right? Um, something's going on there. And I reckon if we can take some of the essence that works out of here and apply it to some of this stuff, and our more important stuff, we might be able to make better progress in real world work because people will actually pay to do good work. And if there were a way that I could, if there was another word for something that was a goal driven, challenge intense, feedback rich uh, experience geared around making progress that wasn't game, I would totally use that. Because most of us have kind of linguistic issues with the word game. We kind of think, ooh, if someone says, don't play games with me, it means you're trying to manipulate, manipulate them. Because that's what games are, right? Games are behavioural manipulation. They are parameters that influence and direct people to act and behave in particular ways. You may have heard the saying, the house always wins, yeah? It's true, the house always wins. Games always favour their maker. If you're not playing a part in designing the game that you play, you're probably being played. But we can change this, we can get our head in the game, we can lift our game, we can change our game to play a better game by thinking like a game designer. Realising that everything that we do, life is an infinite game that consists of many finite games, the overlap of goals, rules and feedback to produce certain results. If you've ever made a cup of tea, cooked a meal, done a project, handed in an assignment, dri driven safely from one point to another, you've played different games. All of those activities have goals, rules and feedback. Any good project has clear goals, it has clear rules, budget, time constraints and it has good ways of obtaining feedback. So I'd like to do a little activity with you. Right now, I'd like you to think about what you're thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like you to think about what you're thinking about. I'd like you to enter a state of metacognition, where you're thinking about what you're thinking about right now. So stay with me in the moment, but think about what you're thinking about. Then, I'd like you to enter a state of double dissociation, where you can see yourself thinking about what you're thinking about. Okay, you with me? So just imagine you can see yourself thinking about what you're thinking about, and you're with me right now. Now, I would like you to imagine that the real you is currently at home playing the current you as part of a massively multiplayer real world role playing game. <laughs> it's pretty awesome, right? Yeah? So you're totally in control. The real you is at home controlling you right now. Have a look at these players around you. Have a look at all the other player characters around you, right? Isn't it amazing? We're all playing this game together. This massively multiplayer real world role playing game of life. The only challenge is, compared to uh, online games, is, is that we don't have these useful parameters. <laughs> you know? Someone, someone's done a fantastic job when Barack Obama first got his, uh, in, into the presidency overlaying World of Warcraft stats over here. Now, what I love is this, this is my favourite bit, this bar here. This is the experience point bar. You see, within games, there's a natural bias to action. There's a bias to staying outside of your comfort zone because the only way to get experience points is by engaging in challenges, which means stepping outside of your comfort zone. You only get experience points by engaging in challenging work. And then if you get enough experience points, you level up, which creates the opportunity to engage in more challenging work, which is pretty cool. So if you're always picking flowers, you're not going to level up. But if you're continuously challenging yourself, you will level up and grow, which is pretty exciting. You then also have your proximal goals there. You have all your abilities to call upon whenever you want. I think that's awesome. So, gameful design. How can we get some of that happening in the real world? Before we get into that, I need to kind of take you on a bit of a journey and I want to share a brilliant model, brilliant model that I've created called the evolution of motivation. Um, it's very exciting. Um, I love the colours and the, the typography is beautiful. Um, First of all is fear. I don't even want to go there. Some people are driven by fear, fear of death, fear of failure, fear of looking bad. Let's move on. A lot of people, when they approach motivation, like how do we get people to do things, they think we need to pay them. We need to incentivize them somehow. We need to promise them that they'll have a chance of promotion. Or we just need to praise them. We just need to keep praising them. Employee of the month, you know, you win, yeah, you're awesome. Um, and this, a lot of the literature on motivation was really born in the Industrial Revolution when it was focused on productivity. 
And the challenge that we're left with now, because a lot of this work, a lot of this formulaic work, a lot of the work with predictable outcomes is being outsourced or it's being replaced by computer systems. The real work that we need and value nowadays is the knowledge work, the thinking work, the ideas work, the creative work, the collaborative work, the stuff that can't be done by computers. And this model of motivation just won't work because the question is, what happens if we can't pay people more? What happens if we can't promote everyone? And you know, if we praise them all the time, that's just gonna get super lame. So what can we do? This is where gamification comes to the rescue. Potentially. Um, there are some great examples of gamification. If you've seen the speed camera lottery uh, by Fun Theory, this is where if you're speeding along uh, over the speed limit, you're going to get a fine and your photo taken. But if you're driving safely under the speed limit, you'll also get a photo and you'll be entered into a pot and you might win some of that fine money from the people who have broken the law, <laughs> which is really exciting. And there's, there's vending machines now that use gamification that literally have people bowing to the vending machine in order to win a free prize. It's very, very exciting and it's great for getting spikes of engagement. But the question I have, thinking longer term, is what happens if we have speed camera lotteries happening and then there's areas without the speed camera lottery? What's going to happen to the behaviour here? Uh, what are, people, are people going to get over like bowing to vending machines to get a free sample? I think they might. And so gamification pr promises a lot of things and it works in the current model that we have for motivation. Instead of paying people more, you can run a competition and reward a few. Instead of promoting everyone, you can create leaderboards and rank people. And instead of praising people, you can give them status or a badge or something and uh, recognise them. That's kind of cool. But it's still motivation 2.0 thinking. It's still the structures that allow for extrinsic, contingent-based motivation to happen. And that's why it's really appealing right now to many people. Gamification, it's quite clever. Done well, it's awesome. Done poorly, you can have like the moustache twirling. Ooh, ha, ha. We can create a, you know, the house always wins. We can create a system that's going to favour us and uh, completely um, screw the, the people working for us. I think we can do better. And I think right now gamification is a bit of a distraction. James Cass, my favourite philosopher, he's, he says of, of trying to force people to play or create environments that m where you must play, anyone who must play cannot play, he says. So we can't have structures, we can't make things a game. I think that what we need to do is do a little bit of a leap. We need to shift from payments to purpose-based work. And instead of making work a game, we need to recognise that it inherently is a game that's probably just poorly designed and begging for some better design. I think we can build in the elements of motivation 3.0, purpose, mastery and autonomy. We've seen these three things in the Olympic Games just now. Anyone who's seen Dan Pink's presentation on the surprising science of uh, what motivates us um, will recognise mastery, purpose and autonomy comes from there, comes from his brilliant work and the work of a lot of researchers in this space. If you haven't seen it, check it out on TED.com. But building on from here, I'd like to borrow some and tweak some elements from another TED presenter whom I actually absolutely adore. And that's where we can actually build in urgent optimism. These are the structures that make mastery, autonomy and purpose happen. We have mastery. Just imagine a situation where you have a progress bar, you have your goals and you know that if you go for that extra run, run this week, then you will maintain your streak of running at least four times a week over the last four months. What a sense of urgent optimism that might give you. Or if you're that close to achieving your goal and you know this because you're tracking yourself and you're giving yourself the opportunity to make progress. If we have the opportunity to amplify our authenticity, this is happening in a lot of digital worlds where people can create their own avatar. So there's something called the Proteus effect where if you actually play as an avatar of your own creation, a digital self-representation, where you actually get to choose how attractive and super you look, you'll actually play more confidently than someone uh, if you were given an ugly character to play as. And what's more, the protea effects actually happens back in the real world too. So if you play as a superhero in a game of your own creation, and then you step back in the real world, you'll actually act and behave more confidently in the real world, which is very exciting. But all this leads to visible progress. We we're talking before about how Progress gives you motivation to make progress, which gives you motivation to make progress. It's a blissful feedback loop. And these structures, the short-circuited feedback loops, this gameful design and approach to work can allow for blissful progress. 
Uh, a lot of these terms are borrowed from Jane McGonigal, uh, who done, has done amazing talks. If you can get a chance to see her on TED.com, please do. She's got a recent one that came out uh, as well. So there's two talks up there for you. These things, components, I'd call 3.1, motivation 3.1. So we've got the 3.0, these are the structures that allow Motivation 3.0 to occur. And all of this might actually lead to a sense of epic legacy. It might mean that we bridge that gap, we achieve our goals, we actually make our ideas happen. See, there's a quote from a, a fictitious game character, one of the boss characters in Bioshock, an underwater city called Rapture. He says, we all make choices, but in the end, our choices make us. Some of the games that we're playing at work and in our other areas of our lives are inherited choices. They were choices made at a different time to serve different purposes. They may not be serving as well now. Sometimes if we want to grow, we need to change the game we play. And just to close, uh, I'd just like to uh, say, you know how there's such a thing as game over? It used to be a thing as game over, you get three lives and then it's game over. Nowadays, you have the opportunity to save your progress. So there's no more game over, there's only game on. Thank you very much.